is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the Town Hall Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight and to provide an overview of this evening's events. The format is a bit different from usual. Our guest speaker, acclaimed journalist, author, and political commentator Carl Bernstein will be in conversation with NPR's editor-at-large and Minnesota's favorite interviewer, Gary Eichton, who, let's give him a round of applause. I should, I should note that Gary is also a member of the Town Hall Forum Advisory Board and makes these programs happen. We're delighted to have both of these gentlemen here this evening to explore the topic, Can the System Work? Politics, Government, and Media. For over 34 years, the Town Hall Forum has offered its programs as a service to the community. All of our events are free and open to the public. Thank you for joining us tonight. And now I'm going to turn the program over, Gary, to you. Gary Eichton, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Tim. Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum here at Westminster Presbyterian in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Gary Eichton from Minnesota Public Radio. Sitting in for forum moderator Tim Hart Anderson, senior pastor at Westminster. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome our guest, one of the best and best known journalists of our generation, Carl Bernstein. Mr. Bernstein is undoubtedly best known as the Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who along with Bob Woodward broke the Watergate story for the Washington Post. Their reporting led to the resignation of the President of the United States and set the standard for modern investigative journalism. That was back in the early 70s. Since then, uh, Carl Bernstein has served as ABC's Washington Bureau Chief and Senior Correspondent. He's a contributing editor at Vanity Fair, regular commentator on MSNBC and CNN, and he's done groundbreaking work for Newsweek and Rolling Stone and the New Republic. He's the visiting presidential professor at Stony Brook State University, and he's written five bestsellers, including All the President's Men and the Final Days about Watergate. Uh, Loyalties, that's a memoir of his family's experience during the McCarthy Red Scare era. He's written a biography of Pope John Paul II, and his latest is called A Woman in Charge, The Life of Hillary Rodham Clinton. Carl Bernstein, welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. You said the other day on CNN that uh, next year's election is going to be unlike any other in our history. Why so? The sheer spectacle of it because largely of Hillary Clinton's candidacy. I, and this election occurs at a time when our political system is broken in a way that perhaps that it's never been. And the question of whether or not the candidates will seriously address how the system is broken and whether and how it can be fixed seems to me of paramount importance. But let's also take a second to look at the phenomenon of Hillary Clinton, which is sui generis, really. We're talking about not just Hillary Clinton, but the Clintons. We're talking about what the enemies of Hillary and Bill Clinton call Clintonism, uh, to which the Republican Party uh, in the year 2000, when she ran for the Senate, uh, uh, and often since has been dedicated uh, to wiping out Clintonism. <laughs> but more than that, the Clintons represent something very different in our history, which is a spectacle of soap ap operatic scale, but really very serious. And at the same time, Hillary Clinton, more than Bill Clinton even, is judged in soap opera terms, in terms of this larger, huge spectacle all over the world tonight. Just as we are here, people are talking at their dinner tables about Hillary Clinton and arguing with each other and yelling at each other and saying she's, you know, the devil's work or she's the most progressive and greatest thing we've ever seen. Uh, and this is going to go on for another 19 months. <laughs> Whoopee. <laughs> Well, do you have the sense, uh, you wrote the, kind of the definitive biography of uh, Hillary Clinton, do you have the sense that she has 
some answers to these problems that you're talking about? Do the Republican candidates have any answers to these, to these problems? Yes and yes, with a big if. And the if is that both sides know that 40 or 30 years of cultural warfare, scorched earth, take no prisoners, politics, and I think, you know, we can apportion the blame a little more to one side, perhaps, or maybe the other one. But the effect of this cultural war has depleted us. And the unwillingness of the two sides in the cultural warfare to acknowledge the goodwill ever of the other side and the legitimacy of the other side ever is somewhere where I think we've never really been, uh, certainly in the last 50 years, in this country, it, uh, it is making our problems almost insoluble in this country. We're not dealing with real existing problems because we can't have a fact-based debate in this country. Let me, let me give an example. What's the ultimate fact-based debate that we've really had of great consequence and fought with such intensity? And that would be the Federalist debate, our founding. Mm -hmm. um, two sides inalterably opposed to the philosophies of each other, uh, which managed to produce, oh, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, not, not bad work for, for coming at it from opposite sides. Well, how did that happen? Because they were able to agree on the terms of debate, real existing conditions, existentially factual, contextual. We cannot have a contextually fact-based debate in this country because everything, and not just our politicians, our media reflects it and our people reflect it, including the consumers of news, is so often being seen through the lens of ideology and partisanship. And there's a place for ideology and a place for partisanship. But right now, it has blinded us uh, to the point of such detriment uh, and no goodwill. And it, it's certainly no goodwill in Washington, which is an obvious. Look, we got one of the three branches of government in this country is totally dysfunctional, the Congress of the United States. But also, those people didn't get there you know, just on their own wings. Some people sent them there. Uh, and they reflect the sentiments, to some extent, of the people who got them there. So I think we need to, and also when we talk about journalism and our failures, of which there are many in journalism, particularly ginning up manufactured controversy to cover one side or both sides of this ideological debate, but people are not looking for the best obtainable version of the truth, which is really what good journalism, good reporting, real information is. Our debate, our political debate, is not based on the base, best obtainable version of the truth, and our journalism increasingly is not dedicated to the best obtainable version of the truth. I, I went to work when I was 16 years old at a great newspaper, the Washington Star, and uh, the afternoon paper in Washington beat the post in those days, and I learned then, and I think Woodward and I and Watergate, you know, what we did was, was fairly elemental and simple. It involved that concept of the best obtainable version of the truth, which is a simple phrase, but it involves some real difficulty and pursuit and common sense and listening to achieve, but it also is required of people seeking information rather than just looking for information to reinforce what they already believe and think they know. And I think that's where we are. Long answer, sorry. So uh, how do you get from here to there, Carl Bernstein? I mean, Barack Obama got elected 2008 claiming he was going to change the culture of Washington. Well, he certainly failed at that. And he was failed by uh, those who might have joined him. Um, and I'm not optimistic. For the first time, I'm not an optimist about, about what's going on in our culture in this country, um, except for young people. You know, I think people of my generation, generation or two afterwards, we took an awful lot from the system. 
and we created amazing things in this country, the greatest meritocracy in the, in the history of the world, the civil rights revolution, the triumph of the public good, the common good, the national interest that stems from the civil rights revolution, gay rights, on and on, the things that have been created, gentrification, great cities, rock and roll, a, a, a huge, don't un underestimate rock and roll as a political force. When you look at, for instance, at the collapse of the Soviet empire, and you look at the role of American popular culture and, and rock and roll, we've done all these amazing things. I've got students at Stony Brook University with student debt that is inundating them. How could this happen in the richest country in the world? We who grew up in middle class and working class families, those are the people who are being choked in this culture today. So I believe from what I can see from young people that they're really, can only generalize so much, disdainful of what we've left them. They look at this politics of scorched earth, take no prisoners, ideo ideological conflict, and, and they say, you know, a pox on both your houses. And they're practical people, I think, young people. And my hope is that they're going to find some way to say not just a pox on both your houses, but to engage in some problem solving. And I, and I think there's one positive thing that is starting to become a movement that might really change this country, and that is compulsory national service for all young people after high school. Uh, how many people, how many men and women here were in the military? Well, I'm not that proud of my military service. Uh, I tried to, to get out of Vietnam by enlisting uh, in the reserves, but I went to basic training, and that's a formative experience, I think, for everybody who just raised their hand. You're thrown together with people different than yourself, a common purpose, uh, some real discipline, uh, common objectives, helping each other, understanding what wounds and moves and allows others to triumph. It's a great, great experience. And I think if our young people went through that with, you could enlist in the military, enlist in a conservation corps, do some kind of teaching uh, for those less fortunate, work in a hospital, work in the woods. Uh, I think, and, and General McChrystal, former Governor Pataki of New York, many others I think, of all kinds of, uh, all across the political spectrum are looking at this, and I think it's the one practical thing that might make all the difference, along with what Hillary Clinton said yesterday, a constitutional amendment to restrict campaign spending. I wanted, uh, wanted to ask you about money and politics, um, estimates, uh, the Clinton campaign expected to spend about two and a half billion, billion. Presumably the Republicans will figure out a way to match. That's five billion dollars. Twice as much as the last presidential election. What do the big donors buy with all that money? Pretty much everything. <laughs> they, what is bought is smothering the debate smothering the opportunity to have a fact-based debate. Because, and look, to have access to our system today, you have to contribute. You have to, look, let's go back to, to maybe where this started. John Corzine, a long time ago, ran uh, for the Senate from New Jersey. Uh, spent $60 million of his own money at the time, which seemed like a fortune. Well, now it costs $150 million or $200 million to run for the Senate from a big state. But what does that mean? That means that if you're going to spend, say, $150 million to run, that the incumbent senator also has to spend that kind of money. You do the math on a six-year term, and it means you're raising, I don't know, you do it at $150,000 a day for every day that you're, you're in the Senate. So what do you think the focus is on? It's obscene. It's, it's so counter-constitutional in terms of the intent of what those people in the Federalist debate 
we're talking about. The idea that, uh, that we would have to, you know, and I think the big issue in, in this campaign domestically is, are we going to have government by and for the wealthy and the connected? Or are we going to have government that is accessible uh, with participation by everyone? And that means that the debate has to be leveled. You can't level the debate until we do something about the money. Because take a look at New York. To be a senator from New York, whether you're Schumer or Clinton, you have got to be sensitive to the whims and demands of bankers, people who want a certain kind of deregulation for themselves that is probably beyond reasonable and good for the country. Uh, so people like Hillary Clinton, like Chuck Schumer, uh, and you have similar things in other states, uh, have, they seem, little choice but to not follow their own instincts uh, because of the role of money. You uh, said that the media has changed a lot. Uh, how has it changed since uh, the Watergate days? Could you uh, break that same story today, cover it in the same way? It sounds like Gabby Hayes asking a question. <laughs> Old timer! <laughs> <laughs> how has it changed? <laughs> Almost in, in every regard. Now, but your, your question is, could, could we or anyone else break that story today? Absolutely. There's great reporting going on in this country uh, and abroad as well, and particularly in countries where there is despotism. There's great reporting going on. But let's talk about this country. Look at the reporting that the Boston Globe did uh, on pedophile priests. One of the great pieces of reporting over the last 50 years. Look at the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, uh, and the New York Times every day. There is great reporting. The, the modern New York Times is as great a newspaper as there has ever been. The Washington Post, even in its diminished circumstance financially and, and the cutbacks, uh, and it's trying to move in a new direction, but back to, to huge amounts of basic reporting and investigative reporting. Great reporting in, in there. There's no and pro publica, and and look look indeed at things uh, like Men Press. Uh, there are all kinds of new platforms. The, the reporting is there. The real question in my mind, back to the question of this idea, of, well, could Watergate be reported today? Uh, you would need uh, an editor like Ben Bradley and a publisher like Kay Graham, and I'll talk about that a little later, uh, and the courage and fearlessness that they showed, and that could be a problem, though I don't think it's a problem at the institutions I've mentioned, the Times, the Post, the Wall Street Journal, even under Murdoch. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think the Wall Street Journal, uh, he's left it pretty much alone, uh, and, and it does terrific work. but. How would that information be received in today's environment? What happened in Watergate? The system worked. The press did its job. We did these stories. Cy Hirsch at the New York Times did some great stories. Time Magazine did some great stories. CBS did remarkable coverage of the stories we were writing. And then a Republican judge, Judge Sirica, in his courtroom, forced the Watergate burglars to acknowledge what we were writing. That there was a cover-up, they were being paid for their silence. Next step, a 77 to nothing vote by the Senate of the United States to conduct an investigation, the Senate Watergate investigation, into the campaign activities of the President of the United States. 77 to nothing. You could not get a 77 to nothing vote of the Senate today to declare Groundhog Day. <laughs> It would be this ideological warfare. And then, when Nixon refused to give up his tapes, the Supreme Court of the United States, with a Republican Chief Justice appointed by Richard Nixon, the President expecting that that Chief Justice would bring this home for Nixon and that he would not be forced to give up his tapes. What happened? The Chief Justice and his other justices convened, and they insisted there be a unanimous decision holding that no one in this country is above the law, including the President of the United States. And the articles of impeachment voted by the House Judiciary Committee 
What were the key votes? I spent the last three days in Illinois, and it was really moving because it's the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's death. And to be in Illinois and to be in Springfield at that time is, is really uh, just a remarkable thing. And you think of Republicans like Railsback from the 18th District of Illinois, who cast a crucial vote in the House Judiciary Committee for articles of impeachment. And then Barry Goldwater, the 1964 nominee of his party for president, marches down to the White House with other Republican leaders when Nixon, who thinks he can beat in the Senate in a trial that he'll be able to get a third of the votes in a Senate trial necessary to be acquitted, Goldwater marches down there, leads a delegation, sits across from the President of the United States who asks him, Barry, how many votes do I have in the Senate? And Goldwater looks at him and says, you certainly don't have mine, Mr. President, nor do you have many Republican votes, not enough to survive. And two days later, Nixon resigned. What I'm getting to here in this roundabout, I keep coming back, though, to this same point, that if we are going to have a functioning system, we've got to find a way that there is some kind of consensus about the common good and about the national interest. And it is impossible in today's political atmosphere so that somehow some president may be able to do what Obama said that he could do, has been prevented from doing, uh, certainly by the opposition party, uh, but also he has, you know, he's the president of the United States. And could he have gone perhaps farther in trying to engage uh, the opposition, I think perhaps, I, I think of one thing that there, a while ago we finally met with some Republican leaders and he took them to dinner at the Jefferson Hotel. And I said to myself, the Jefferson Hotel, is the White House chef off that night? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many of you have been in the White House. You go in there and you got the pictures of, of Jefferson, Lincoln, Washington. And, you know, I've been in there, I don't know how many times since I'm 16 years old and went to work in this business. You get a lump in your tummy every time you walk in the White House. And that the power of the presidency and persuasion is inherent in that house. And to not use it for that purpose. Um, so, so I keep coming back to this, that, that this is the great question. Can we fix our system? Do we have leaders? in both parties, and what's interesting about, about the Democrats, it seems to me, is that people like President Clinton, like Hillary Clinton, like Bill Clinton, have such a great understanding of our problems and solutions, but are they willing to say and take positions that might be a little antithetical to conventional, progressive even, wisdom? That, that maybe there's some things that we've taken for granted so long, perhaps about some, quote, entitlements. Maybe we do have to look at the cost of Medicare. Maybe we do have to refashion Medicare. But, and, uh, and then, of course, you have the other party uh, of such incredible obstructionism, uh, unlike anything I've seen in the, in the 55 years that since I went to work when I was 16 years old at the Star. So that's where we are. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, coming to you from Westminster Presbyterian Church on the Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Gary Eichen. Our guest is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and commentator Carl Bernstein. Reminder to join us here at Westminster next month on Thursday, May 14th at noon, Senior Pastor Tim Hart Anderson will be back to moderate a forum featuring political analyst David Brooks. Should be a dandy program. You can always find out more about the forum at westminsterforum.org. And a reminder, of course, that all of our forums are free and open to the public. Now, time for some audience questions. So if you would, please, if you've got a question, just jot it, jot it down. Ushers will pick them up, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, while we're waiting for audience questions, Carl, uh, what is a journalist today? Uh, is it uh, the old-fashioned reporter types? Is it uh, people with video cameras, uh, what, all, bloggers? All, all of the above. 
Uh, there's certainly a new configuration of media uh, that is directly a result of digitalization of the web. The old, quote, traditional media is in retreat. Uh, the newspaper model, economic model, has failed, hence the decline of newspapers. Uh, but also, even before the web, as happened here when McClatchy came in or Gannett went into town after town and stripped, you know, when, those, when they came into those towns, newspaper business in the late 90s was still making 19% a year. You know, huge profit. Uh, and what did they do? Most of them certainly, uh, Gannett came in, took a two newspaper town, closed one down, stripped the local papers uh, so there was barely any reporting left, uh, real reporting. So, so things were happening before the web uh, came along and, and made things even, even more difficult. But the web is a great vehicle for delivering reporting. I mean, look, read the New York Times online and see what you can do online that you can't do in the paper. Infinite length uh, for sidebars, for stories, for video, for documents. And, um, and also there's a diversity uh, now of repertorial as well as opinionated journalism that did not exist uh, in, in the 70s and 80s and even, even the 90s. But the noise of the internet, of the environment of 24-7, is deafening and smothering. But it also is serving customers who want it, and not just young customers. So I come back to this idea. Look, we've always had yellow journalism. I wrote a piece in 1993, a cover story for the New Republic magazine called The Triumph of Idiot Culture. You can read it on my website. <laughs> well, it was about, it was about, I'm gonna find something else to read if I, I don't think I have it here. Uh, that it was about the increasing dominance in the press of gossip, sensationalism, and manufactured controversy, and particularly manufactured controversy the idea that, oh, to be a reporter means you come in with a microphone, you shove it in the face of Mitch McConnell, then you shove it in the face of Harry Reid, you ask him some questions that you know they'll scream at each other and raise holy hell, and you run out of the room. Rather than trying to dig deep about who they are, about what the issues are, about how they relate to their district, all manner of things. It's not real reporting, but we've always had yellow press. We've always had sensationalism. But now, as I wrote in that piece in 93, and the situation's far worse since this idiot culture configuration, um, but it's not just journalism. You can't separate reporting and journalism from the rest of the larger culture. Same with our politics. All of this is connected, and, and so much of the focus, it seems to me, when I read about it, uh, whether I'm reading in Vanity Fair or whether I'm reading even in the New York Post often or about these phenomena of uh, where is the press, where is our politics, I don't see enough of the connection between the people of the country and the phenomena. It always seems to me it's focused on the reporters, it's focused on the press, it's focused on the politicians. Somebody out there must be wanting this crap. Uh, and, uh, and people making a lot of money off of it. And also, I think we gotta talk about one other thing here, and that is Fox News. <laughs> it, it Fox News is probably the most potent political force that we've had in this country in the last 30 years. It has Again, you can't make a metric for this, you can't prove it, but I certainly believe it has changed our politics. Uh, it has amplified views that, nothing wrong with the philosophy perhaps, or having a philosophical debate, but so much of what has been amplified has nothing to do with the best obtainable version of the truth, but rather uh, is demonstrably untrue. 
and, and so it has this vast amplification uh, quality to it that has occurred. MSNBC, uh, different on the other side, uh, and, and yet at the same time, uh, MSNBC, uh, and like the networks themselves, really, they're not really reporting organizations any, anymore. And um, so I, all this stuff is connected. That's, uh, that, that's what I really believe, and that, that if change is going to come, it's going to require great leadership, it's going invo to involve young people, it's going to involve some self-examination, um, and, and by all of us. Audience question for you, Carl Bernstein. Do you see any similarities between Nixon erasing his tapes and Hillary Clinton deleting her emails as <laughs> Secretary of State? Yes, in the desire to not have people know what was discussed in your work. In that sense, yes. But I think it's very important to remember what Watergate was about, and I'll come back to Hillary Clinton in a minute, and who Richard Nixon was. He was a criminal president of the United States who presided over a criminal presidency from its first days <laughs> until its last. And, and lest we, let's, let's just look at how that criminal presidency was manifested. Uh, because there's still some revisionism, though I think the tapes have put an end to most of it, uh, about Nixon and his presidency. But, Listen to this tape from June 17, 1971, exactly one year before the Watergate break-in. And really, there were five wars, as Bob and I have written in the uh, 40th anniversary edition of All the President's Men. There were five wars of Watergate, all of the, four of them criminal, uh, using espionage and sabotage and burglaries and break-ins, first to undermine the anti-war movement, then reporters and the free press, uh, through wiretapping, through burglaries, uh, then uh, political opposition, Watergate itself, saboteurs of the Muskie campaign, trying to engineer, which really was what uh, what happened in the Watergate break-in and related activities designed to try and make George McGovern the 1972 nominee of the Democratic Party. As Sam Irvin, the chairman of the Watergate committee said, this was about undermining our very system of free elections in this country through political espionage and sabotage. Um, and it's worth going back to, to read uh, what really happened, but let's listen to this tape one year before the break-in. Nixon is in the Oval Office with his Chief of Staff, Bob Haldeman, Henry Kissinger, his National Security Advisor, and they're discussing a file that they believe is in a safe in a think tank in Washington called the Brookings Institution, and that this file from Lyndon Johnson's presidency would show that his handling of the 1968 bombing halt was even more egregious than Nixon's handling of the war, and thus would make Nixon look better and tend to undermine the anti-war movement, which was making life so difficult for Nixon. So then you hear Nixon's chief of staff say to the president and Kissinger, quote, you can blackmail Johnson on this stuff and it might be worth doing, and he means smear. And Kissinger says, yeah, but Bob and I have been trying to put the damn thing together for three years. They wanted the complete story that was in that file in the safe. Haldeman says, Houston swears to God there's a file on it at Brookings. Houston is an aide to Nixon, John Charles Houston, who in the first months of the Nixon presidency was charged by the president to come up with a plan for burglaries and, and uh, break-ins and illegal wiretapping of the anti-war movement. And it, it was stopped by, of all people, J. Edgar Hoover, who told Nixon, you can't do this. <laughs> So then, what can I tell you? Uh, so then Nixon says, and you hear on an earlier tape, back when Houston is working on this, you hear Nixon say, I know it's illegal, but we have to do it. 
and that's not the exact quote, but him saying uh, he knows it, it's illegal is the, a quote. Nixon now says, Alderman, you remember Houston's plan, implement it. I mean, I want it implemented on a thievery basis. God damn it, get in and get those files, blow the safe and get it. <laughs> the President of the United States. He wouldn't let the matter drop, the President. Thirteen days later, according to another tape discussion with Haldeman and Kissinger, the President says, break in and take it out, you understand. And the next morning, Nixon says, Bob, get on the Brookings thing right away. I've got to get that safe cracked over there. The President of the United States, a criminal President of the United States. Watergate was not about a third-rate burglary as the White House called it, and Nixon continued to call it. And later he said that morning, who's going to break into the Brookings Institution? So that's what we're talking about here. And Hillary Clinton's emails are not about a criminal Secretary of State. That said, there have attended the Clintons, uh, and particularly Hillary Clinton, I call it the, the end of, of uh, a woman in charge, and it, it's in context. You have to read the book, and I hope you will. Uh, what I write as a, quote, difficult relationship with the truth. <laughs> and, <clears throat> but I try to put it in some context by saying that She's hardly different from most conventional politicians in this regard, but she's always aspired to be better than conven conventional. But in her artfully crafted public utterances and written sentences, there has almost always been an effort at baseline truthfulness, yet almost always something holds her back from telling the whole story as if she doesn't trust the reader, listener, friend, interviewer, constituent, or perhaps herself to understand the true significance of events. And again, back to the idea of the Clintons and Hillary Clinton being somewhat sui generis also. Enemies, unlike anything that we have seen in our politics uh, until President Obama took office. Um, and she fiercely uh, has defended herself and her husband against what she thinks are the ruinous and homicidal, politically homicidal uh, intent of, of their political enemies. And so all of this figures in it. So I think we need to look at a context. I think if you read this whole biography, you understand this remarkable life that Hillary Clinton has had since uh, her childhood, growing up in a family, her father, again, contrary to what she writes in Living History about her, her memoir, about this almost idyllic suburban childhood of hers in suburban uh, Illinois. Well, you know, I interviewed the people who knew her best, including extended members of her family, uh, her closest friend from uh, grammar school and high school. Uh, her father was a misanthrope who was abusive to her mother, uh, verbally abusive. Uh, and, and this was not an idol. And everything about Hillary Clinton is more complicated than we've been led to believe, some of which, to her detriment, she has failed to convey. What are the three biggest things, really, in, in her life that are consistent? Religion as the basis for so much of what she does. She grew up uh, in a Methodist household, we came under the influence of a, a Methodist Wesleyan teacher whose idea of Christianity and, and the Gospels were, were, were the teachings of Christ uh, and his message about what must be done uh, for your fellow man. And, and that remains a, a big part. You know, when she went to the Senate with no fanfare, nothing on her sleeve, she joined one of those Christian prayer groups with all the right-wing senators, uh, didn't make a big fuss about it. She did it because that's a part of her. Religion, 
family, and then you begin to understand some of the dynamics, because this is a real love affair between Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, whatever you and I might think uh, it, it looks like or has looked like. Each is the brightest star in the other's universe. Uh, it was a co-presidency, and if there is to be another Clinton presidency, uh, it certainly will have large elements of a co-presidency. Um, and, and Bill Clinton is certainly very brilliant, knowledgeable about a lot of things. Um, so there are dimensions to her that, that we don't know about. And the, and the other thing, of course, is public service, which she really believes in. Um, that said, uh, there's the execution of, uh, of public service. And, and we need to look at what the record is of that and how she goes about it. Where would a uh, U.S. citizen turn to get truthful news if you claim it's our responsibility to do so? <laughs> you know, at Stony Brook, the journalism department there, and I teach different courses over a two-year cycle, journalism, American history, political science, and memoir writing. But the journalism department there had developed a course called news literacy that they've now exported to, to dozens and dozens of universities about how to sort through news if you're really interested, or through media if you're really interested in how to do it. And it's a great thing, and the more of it that, that uh, gets out there, the better. Um, I first, you know, read the New York Times every day, and that's a pretty good beginning, or the Washington Post, or the Wall Street Journal. But we also got to look at the fact that young people, by and large, are not interested in reading the New York Times, or the Wall Street Journal, or, or, or the Washington Post. Um, but they carry on traditional news values of the best obtainable version of the truth. Um, but the web has such possibilities. Let's look at what just happened with Netanyahu. Uh, in Washington, and then the election. Uh, look what you could do online if you really wanted to find something out. You could, sure, you could read uh, the Times, you could read the Post, you could go to the English language site of Haaretz from Israel. You could read the Jerusalem Post. We have this ability to, to pull out anything that we want, but it's a question of discriminating, and I think that's so hard for people, particularly because so many people are looking for this information that will simply be fuel for their ideological bandwagon. I wanted to ask you about the uh, Charlie Hedbo uh, attack. Uh, there are people who say it's French satirical newspaper, people who have not said that they deserve to be attacked, but have suggested that the media should uh, take a look at itself and not deliberately insult, inflame people. What do you think about that? I think you got to go back to Jonathan Swift. Uh, <laughs> I think you have to look at uh, this notion, that, look, there, there ought to be some kinds of self-censorship for all kinds of reasons in various situations, including certain national security secrets, uh, all kinds of things, common sense. But the idea uh, that satire is somehow off limits is repulsive. And also, there's a real question here about the nature and the basic documents and the basic teachings of one of the, th one of the three great faiths. Uh, that question uh, ought to be looked at from every angle, including satirically, as have Christianity, Judaism, uh, I, I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. uh, you grew up in a household that was under FBI surveillance for the better part of 30 years. Um, your parents were members of the Communist Party, were they not? They what were. Was, what was that like? And were they, uh, uh, were they a threat to the nation? No. Uh, <laughs> They were a threat to my well-being, I thought, sometimes. But <laughs> no, 
and they were part of a very courageous group of people in Washington, D.C., who integrated the capital of the United States, mostly left-wing people working with, with uh, white left-wing people working with, with black people. And, you know, it, it's, I was thinking about it when I was in Illinois yesterday, and I went to Lincoln's tomb, actually, yesterday. And uh, my five years at the Washington Star bracket the Civil War by exactly a century. And, and the, the Civil War then still cast its shadow over uh, the nation even more than today, much more than, than today, and particularly in Washington. How many people here, I went to segre legally segregated public schools in the capital of the United States till Brown. How many people here know that the, the, the public schools in the District of Columbia, the capital of the United States, were segregated till 1954? One, two, three, four, and we're in Minnesota. And this is an audience of people, many of whom are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So think about this. The companion case to Brown is Bowling versus Sharp, which is the DC school system. Uh, and that case was decided on the Fifth Amendment uh, Equal Protection Clause, Brown on the 14th Amendment Due Process. Uh, and I was in the sixth grade when our schools were, were integrated. They were segregated till then. My mother, native of Washington, went to segregated public schools, as did J. Edgar Hoover, who went to the same school she did. And um, so the surveillance, there was huge surveillance of left-wing people in the 1950s during the so-called witch hunts, the McCarthy period, though a lot of uh, so-called McCarthyite stuff begins earlier and in, in, in Harry Truman's loyalty order, uh, which set up a system of loyalty oaths in government departments has a lot to do with what happened, which is what my memoir about my family is partly about. Um, so I assumed at the time the surveillance was going on. My parents assumed that it was. And uh, there came a time at the Star uh, when I, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and, and that my family got a pretense call, uh, as did other people that they knew, uh, asking, you know, where were they, where were they going to be next week? And what it was about uh, is a piece of, of legislation um, that had provided for camps, actually, to be established in a national emergency. Uh, that security risks would be taken to. And later we've seen the documentation of, of how Hoover tried to set that in motion at the time and what those calls were. I'm going to presuppose your question and say we're heading to Snowden. <laughs> thought about it. <laughs> uh, traitor, uh, hero, patriot, something else? So, um, not a hero, not a traitor something else, certainly in the tradition of whistleblowers, which uh, like Daniel Ellsberg in the Pentagon Papers, a uh, whistleblower meaning someone who commits an act of civil disobedience, knowing what the consequences are, knowing that in Snowden or Ellsberg's case that, that he's taken an oath, that, that he won't violate the secrecy agreement that he has signed, that he has been uh, trusted with secrets, and, and now he's disclosing them, and disclosing them illegally. And yet, he believes that the larger public good uh, makes this justifiable. To me, the amazing thing about the Snowden disclosures is that they took so many people by surprise, including in the press. There was a book published uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, called The Puzzle Palace, about the National Security Agency and what it, what it does. And this was still a, even in the analog era, era, I think. Look, it's a giant vacuum cleaner. It sucks up all the electronic information in the world that it can possibly get into its hose. And then it puts it in the bag and it doesn't put the bag in the trash. <laughs> and it goes back through the bag and sifts through the information uh, when it needs to. And the vastness of that intelligence gathering uh, and of that suction is, is 
imaginable, not unimaginable, because you have to assume that given the charge of that agency and given terrorism and given the national defense and given that, that they're going to get every damn piece of information that they can. Uh, and terrorism is real. And it's a real threat, not just to the United States, but to, to all of us, to, uh, to the world generally. There's, there's a lot of... Uh, I'm not suggesting for a minute that our approach, that this government's approach to dealing with terrorism is a coherent or smart one. Uh, but the threat is real. And uh, much more real uh, than conventional warfare between nation states. Nation states. So this surprise at what the NSA was doing baffled me to some extent. Uh, and but what is so apparent is that the lack of oversight of this draconian machine, if put to illicit use, is so spectacularly failing that there is no effective oversight. Imagine what a Nixon would do with information from this vacuum cleaner if he could have had it. Imagine what a couple of those committee chairman in Congress might do if they could get their hands on some of this information surreptitiously. I won't mention any names. Um, so the, the potential for abuse is so awful. And there have been abuses, there's no question. Uh, so the great contribution, it seems to me, of Snowden is by reawakening and awakening people in this country and around the world to the scale of what's happening uh, has revealed the total lack of oversight by either the Congress, by the special courts that are supposed to be uh, overseeing and regulating what the NSA does. Uh, and obviously there needs to be some curtailment of some of, uh, of its mission. Um, but, but by and large, uh, the, the idea that this is some kind of rogue agency uh, doing awful things uh, routinely, I'm not at all convinced of. Um, so that would be my, where I would go with that. Carl Bernstein, quick question before we wrap up. Uh, all the president's men, uh, you are portrayed in the movie by Dustin Hoffman, a great actor. Woodward was portrayed by Robert Redford. Are, are you satisfied with how that played out? I absolutely think it is. I mean, look, Woodward is about as goyish as you can get. Uh, it's not going to work for, for Redford, who's that equally goyish, uh, to play me. I think, I, I think that Hoffman was a really inspired choice. And the great thing about the movie of all the president's men, getting back to where we started, it's about reporting. It's not about our personal lives. It's not about our characters. It's about two guys aged 28, 29 years old who go out to do a story. And it shows you how reporting works, what the best obtainable version of the truth is, and how you might go about doing it. That's it. Carl Bernstein, thank you so much for that. And thanks to all of you for...